Hi. On Workbench today, I finally get my hands on an O1HDS 22OS scope meter. This is the latest and greatest in O1's HDS 200 series lineup. It has a dual channel 200 MHz oscilloscope built in along with a 20,000 counts digital multimeter and a single channel arbitrary waveform generator that is capable of outputting a sine wave up to 25 MHz. Banggood sent in this unit for me to do a review on. As usual, I will leave a product link in the video description below for those who are interested in getting one after watching this video. For those who have been following my channel, you probably have already seen my review videos on the 70 MHz version of the HDS 272S and the 100 MHz version of the HDS 2102S. And those videos have certainly generated a lot of interests. And quite a few viewers have been asking me to do a review on this latest model for a while now. So in this video, let's take a deeper look at the HDS 2202S and see how well it performs. But before we do that, let me briefly show you all the models in O1's HDS 200 series lineup. Here on the workbench, I have three of them that I have reviewed before. As you can see here, the main differences between these models are the bandwidth and sampling rate. In fact, the multimeter and signal generator specs are the same for all these models including the CAT ratings. Personally, if I were to buy one, I would definitely get the S version with the AWG as it only costs slightly more. And when you do need a signal generator in the field, the built-in AWG will come in handy. Again, appearance-wise, you can see here, all these meters are essentially the same except for the printed labels on the top. While combing through the specs, one thing jumped out at me, and that is the real-time sampling rate for this scope. First is that the sampling rate for the HDS2202 has been increased to 1 gig samples per second, which doubles the sampling rate of the 2102 and quadruples the sampling rate of the 272. And also you can see that the sampling rate for the 2202 is at 1 gig samples per second, regardless of whether it is in single channel or dual channel operation. This is really unusual as most of the scopes, even the very expensive ones, commonly multiplex the front-end sampling ADCs across multiple channels. And you typically see the sampling rate halves when you enable both channels in a two-channel oscilloscope. And this is exactly what we see here for all the prior versions, but not the 2202. I bet we'll see a different ADC in this 2202, so we will definitely need to investigate a little bit further when we do the teardown later. Another minor difference I spotted is the power consumption. The 2202 is definitely more power hungry compared to its predecessors, which is not surprising given the higher performance. I actually didn't notice in my previous reviews that the capacities of the batteries provided are different depending on the model. By the look of it, the 2202 uses the same 2600 mAh 18650 cells as in the 100 MHz version, whereas the 272 uses two 2200 milliamp hour cells. Anyway, besides power consumption, the sampling rate and the specs related to the bandwidth and all other specs are exactly the same across the entire HDS 200 series. With the specs aside, let's take a look at what comes with this scope meter. The packaging and accessories are pretty much the same, just like the 272 and 2102 I reviewed before. You get two sets of this BNC to banana clip cables and a set of multimeter probes, a charger, and a USB-C cable here. Banggood also threw in an adapter so you can use the USB charger in North America. The only difference in accessory is the bandwidth of the supplied oscilloscope probes. The 272 comes with a 70 MHz probe, whereas the 2102 comes with a 100 MHz probe. And of course, the 2202 comes with this 200 MHz probe, as you'd expect. And by the way, the multimeter and arbitrary waveform generator on this meter are exactly the same as those in the other models, as I mentioned before. I actually tested the multimeter and the signal generator on this 2202, and I can tell you that they perform exactly the same as in the 272 and 2102. There's unfortunately no performance difference there, so I'm not going to spend time in this video on that. If you wanted to see a comprehensive review of all the functionalities, including the supplied PC software, I'd suggest you checking out my review video of the 272 version. Now let's power it up and take a closer look at the oscilloscope. 
Of course, I realized that the protection film is still on. Let's first peel it off. The first thing I noticed immediately is that it actually takes slightly longer to boot up than what I remembered with the other model. So let me power it off and I'm going to compare it with a 2102 here. So let me just bring that in. Let me put them side by side and uh, let's power them on at the same time. Yeah, you can see here the 2102 boots up immediately, whereas this one has some kind of a post-processing after the initial boot up. I'm not entirely sure why this is the case, but presumably has something to do with the revamped front end, which now supports 200 MHz bandwidth. Anyway, let me put that aside. Okay, so now I have hooked it up to the UTG962E, and I'm going to output a 1V peak-to-peak, 1 MHz signal here. So let me auto-require it. And no problem, as you can see that we see the signal that is stabilized on the oscilloscope. The controls on this scope is actually not as intuitive as some other scopes. If you want to change the horizontal, for example, you have to press the horizontal, and you can change the time base up and down here. So you can see, we can definitely zoom it in, and you now see the sampling rate changes to one giga samples per second. So that is uh, the fastest sampling rate. And uh, let me change it back. So at uh, 500 nanoseconds, you can see that it changes to 500 mega samples per second. So that's how you change the horizontal. Now to change the vertical, you have to press the channel. And right now we're on channel one. So you can see that vertical scale, you can change it using these two buttons as well. So anyway, so that is uh, no problem at all. And uh, we can, again, change the time base to be a little bit of, uh, faster here. And now I'm generating a one megahertz AM signal that is uh, one volt peak to peak with 10 kilohertz modulation on top. So let's uh, take a look to see if we can acquire that signal. And uh, let's reduce the time base here so we can actually see the modulation. And you can see that uh, the signal is actually really stable. And now what you're looking at is a frequency modulated signal at uh, one kilohertz with a frequency deviation of 100 hertz. And you can see how fast the waveform capture rate is. Next, let me demonstrate the single shot capability of this uh, oscilloscope. So for that, I have hooked it up to a power supply, and you can see that I have set the trigger to single shot. And let me power it on, and we'll take a look here. As you can see, we have captured the power on curve of the power supply. So let's do some measurement on that. Let me go to measure, cursor, type will be channel one time. And let's move it. Let's just start from here. B, let's uh, put it here. So you can see that roughly 60 milliseconds for the power supply to reach the stable voltage. And now let me demonstrate the Lisa Ru figure using XY mode. A lot of the digital scopes actually are having issues with uh, displaying XY mode because of the refresh rate and also the waveform update rate. But for the HDS200 series, this is not a problem. We have demonstrated that with the 272 and the 2102 reviews, but here I'm going to do it again. At the moment, we're inputting two 1 kilohertz sinusoidal signals, and I'm going to vary the input frequency of one of the signals here. You can see that we are picking up the lizard figure with no problem at all. Of course, the key feature that distinguishes this model from the others in the HDS 200 series is the 200 megahertz bandwidth. And uh, let's test it out. For that, I'm using my HP 8642B RF signal generator, outputting a 0 dB signal. And you can see that right now it is at 200 megahertz. We have on the screen here, the frequency measurement, you can see that it is 200 megahertz. 
Unfortunately, I can't find my 50 ohm termination adapter at the moment, so that output from the signal generator is connected directly to the channel input via BNC cable. I know that you all are screaming at me as without the proper termination, the bandwidth measurement will not be accurate. I know that, but we can definitely get a good sense of the maximum frequency the scope can measure. So right now it is at 200 MHz. Let me just increase the frequency output and see if we can still observe the signal on the oscilloscope. And you can see that we are at, let me just go to 250 MHz directly here. So right now we are at 250 MHz. Actually, we now dropped to be about 60% of the waveform. So clearly we are exceeding the bandwidth, but we are still able to measure that waveform very stably here on the scope. Now, the interesting thing is the frequency measurement, we were not able to measure the frequency anymore. I'm not sure when did that drop off. Let's see at uh, what frequency here. Looks like we are right about 237, 238. That's when we were no longer able to measure the frequency. But uh, nevertheless, we can still measure the waveform on this scope. So let's keep increasing the frequency here. You can see that right now we're approaching 300 megahertz and we're still able to get some signal on this oscilloscope. And uh, let's just run it to 300 megahertz. Yeah, we are not able to see the signal that clearly anymore because the amplitude had dropped significantly. But let's uh, see here. We are able to change the scale. Yeah, we can still recognize that signal. You can see that this is at 300 megahertz. And uh, although the amplitude dropped significantly, we have no trouble acquiring that signal. So let me increase a little bit more in terms of frequency here. And you can definitely see at, um, so right now, the sine wave started to distort quite a bit. Let's uh, get to 350 megahertz. And you can definitely see some artifacts on the acquired signal already. Let me just zoom it in here. But we're still able to acquire that signal. And uh, let me, yeah, and also you can see that we already have some offset issue on the acquired signal, but nevertheless, it is still useful if you just want to detect whether or not the signal is present. And right now we're actually able to measure the 350 megahertz. So let me keep increasing a little bit. And right now is at 400 megahertz. You can see that we definitely are not able to measure the waveform very cleanly. And there's a lot of distortion there. And of course the front end is probably not designed to be able to handle this bandwidth. That is totally understandable as the scope is only rated for 200 megahertz. Also you notice some difference between the 2202 and the 2102 is that the minimum horizontal setting is at one nanosecond per division as we can see right here. As I mentioned earlier, the maximum sampling rate of this scope is specced at one gig samples per second for either a single channel or dual channel measurements. So let's enable channel two and verify this. That's channel one, let's do channel two. Now let me turn it on. You can see that here the signal measured on both channels did not change when we enabled channel two. And remember right now we're inputting a 400 megahertz signal. And if you look at the sampling rate, it remains at one gig samples per second right here. I know that I mentioned earlier, since I don't have a 50 ohm termination here, the amplitude measurement will not be very accurate. But just for completeness, I do want to sweep from 100 megahertz all the way up. And let's take a look at the amplitude drop here. So now I am at 100 megahertz, and you can see we are roughly occupying about eight of these uh, verticals. And let me increase the frequency here. And you can see that the frequency response started dropping here. 
So at about 150 megahertz, we reached about, uh, so this is roughly 80% of the original magnitude. So let's keep increasing the frequency here. So you can see at 200 megahertz, we are roughly, give or take, about 70% of the original amplitude. So that roughly corresponds to the bandwidth. Now let's actually try to determine the bandwidth of the scope using an avalanche pulse generator. Avalanche pulse generators have very fast rising edge, and for all intents and purposes, the pulse generator's rise time can be ignored when doing our measurements. The scope's bandwidth then can be inferred from the rise time measurements. It's 350 over the rise time in nanoseconds. So let's turn on the pulse generator and uh, let's acquire the signal. And of course, we have to adjust the time base a little bit to see the signal clearly. And by the way, you can see here the waveform update rate of this HDS200 series is really fast. It's spec'd at 10,000 waveforms per second. Now, many oscilloscopes would have issues triggering on the pulse generator's output due to the extreme narrow pulses. But you can see here, the O1 has no problem triggering on that. Now let me adjust the horizontal setting so we can see the actual pulse here. So I'm reducing the pulse, reducing the time base rather. And now you can see the pulse. So let me bring it down a little bit so we can see it clearly here. This is one nanosecond. Let me just do actually the one nanosecond here. And I'm going to, let's see here, channel one. And uh, let me bring it down. And we'll do some measurement on this pulse. You can see that the rise time here measured is roughly at 1.36 nanoseconds. So that translates to roughly 257 megahertz of a bandwidth. And by the way, as a refresher, the rise time is measured between roughly 10% and 90% of the step signal amplitude here. And for the HDS2102, the same measurement yields a rise time of roughly 3 nanoseconds, as you can see here. The specified rise time is less than 3.5 nanoseconds. So this translates into a bandwidth of roughly 116 megahertz. Here is the same measurement for the 272S. As you can see here, we are not able to capture the signal cleanly, and there's a lot of distortion here. But nevertheless, you can see the rise time is roughly at, let's see here, at 4 nanoseconds, which is well within the 5 nanoseconds specified for this scope. Before I proceed with the teardown, I do want to take a look at the current consumption of the HDS2202. So for that, I have hooked up the power supply to the oscilloscope directly, as you can see here, and I hook those to the battery terminal directly. And currently, the power is off. So let me power it up and take a look at the current consumption. Let me zoom in so you can see here. And we're currently drawing about 1.2 amps. Now, that is quite a bit higher, if I recall, compared to the HDS2102 and the 272. And those meters drew about, uh, I would say, 700 to 800 milliamps when in the oscilloscope mode. And this one you can see is quite a bit higher. Now, that is probably due to the higher bandwidth of this scope, so the circuitry is definitely different. So we'll take a look in our teardown, but right now let me cycle through different modes and see if the current consumption changes. And you can see that when we're cycling through the current roughly state at 1.2 amps. So that is the approximate operating current draw of this meter. Now I'm measuring the standby current, as you can see, it is at 26.5 microamp, which is excellent. All right, let's start on the battery side. The overall layout looks pretty much identical to that of the 2102 and 272. And by the way, I'm going to take some high-res photos and post them on my website.
If you wanted to investigate a little bit more by yourself, you can follow the link provided in the video description below. I had also done a comparison blog post on my website before on the differences between the 2102 and 272, so you can compare the inside of all these three scope meters. By casually looking at it, the only difference I can spot is the shielding can for the input channels. It looks like O1 had extended the width quite a bit, and now it ends at the negative terminals of the battery holder. And presumably, the extra shielding is needed for the much improved bandwidth and for reducing noise. And here you can see this cutout for this electrolytic capacitor, and neither the 2002 nor the 272 model had this cutout. It is a little bit puzzling to see this, as it would be much easier to increase the height of the shielding can a little bit, and maybe perhaps just by a millimeter or two, in order to be able to cover this capacitor rather than cutting a hole through. And towards this end, let me just move it in here. You can see this QFN chip. That is a SGM41521, and that is a lithium ion battery charger chip. On the other side, we have this 16 pin QFN with a VUCI marking, and that is a Texas Instruments TLV6150 step down converter chip. And before I flip it over, let's take a look at the remaining sections here. This is a DMM section. And you can see this is actually identical by the look of it to what we have seen before. Now let's take a look at the other side. Again, as you can see that the digital multimeter section looks pretty much identical to that in the 2102. And the main application processor here used is also a GD32F303 and ARM Cortex-M3 microcontroller from Giga device. Let me carefully flip over the LCD so we can take a look at the other side. On the side you can see that the FPGA used is exactly the same as that we saw in the 2102, and that's not surprising. And as we predicted, the ADC used is different in the 2202 here. And uh, the marking says LS08D1500. Now, this is made by Lindsay Microelectronics, a Chinese chip design firm. Although I cannot find any information on this specific chip, by the model number designation, it appears that this is supposed to be a replacement for the TI-ADC08D1500. And that is a dual channel 8-bit 1.5 giga samples per second ADC. This ADC is quite powerful. It can operate up to 1.7 gig samples per second, according to Texas Instruments specs. It is also quite power hungry. It consumes at around 1.8 watts during operation. Depending on how well designed the clone is, the power consumption could actually be much higher than the TI's number. This partially explains why the current draw of the 2202 is almost 50% higher or 400 milliamps higher than its predecessors. Now, of course, that's just my speculation based on the markings on this chip. TI's ADC 08D1500 is actually quite expensive, at more than $400 in large quantities. So I'm still not quite convinced the performance of the LS 08D1500 can actually match the performance of the TI chip. But from our testing earlier, it does seem to suggest that the performance of this ADC from Lindsay Microelectronics is actually quite impressive. The signal generator portion, as we expected, uses the same DAC 904, a 14-bit, 165 mega samples per second digital to analog converter chip, as what we saw in the 2102. Let's take a look at what other things we can see here. This chip here is a 8V97051, which is a low-power wideband fractional RF synthesizer. And uh, let's see what else. We also, if I move down here, these are some either a EEPROM or a uh, flash memory here. From this review, you can see that the performance of this 2202S scope meter is definitely impressive. And if you need the 200 MHz bandwidth for a portable scope meter, this meter is worth your serious consideration. All in all, just like his predecessors, the 2202S is way ahead of its competitors, both in terms of performance and quality. Obviously, the 200MHz version costs a lot more than the lower bandwidth versions, 
So ultimately, your choice depends on your need. But as I mentioned earlier, I would definitely get the S version regardless of which model you choose, as it has the signal generator built in. With the general design of the HDS200 series, there is obviously still room for future improvements, and I wouldn't be surprised if O1 releases a version with even higher bandwidth in the future. But in my opinion, it reaches the point of diminishing returns for just pursuing higher bandwidth alone. As for most hobbyists, 200 MHz bandwidth is plenty, and even 100 MHz bandwidth is more than adequate. It would be great if Owen can put the priority on improving the firmware and adding additional capabilities, such as FFT and protocol decoding and other measurement types before putting efforts on improving the bandwidth further. The performance of the digital multimeter also has a lot to be desired, and if it can be improved, it would make the scope meter even more attractive than it already is. Anyway, that is just my opinion. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please leave a comment in the comment section below and tell me what you think about this meter. And if there are any other tests you want me to do or confirm, please let me know as well, and I may do a follow-up video based on these requests. As always, if you enjoyed the video, please give it a big thumbs up, and remember to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your support is greatly appreciated. I will catch up the next time.